morning. Good morning. There it is. Good morning. Can y'all give God a hand of praise in this house? Amen. <laughs> praise the Lord. Whew, I'm glad to be back in Texas. We were in Florida for a little bit. Got to preach at one of my buddy's churches in Florida. Uh, not this last Sunday, but the Sunday before. Had a good time there. Can I tell you the same Holy Spirit that's right here this morning is in Tampa, Florida as well. Amen. Such an awesome thing. He's got a growing and thriving church there. Uh, he just recently moved to two services, and so he's been the senior pastor there for two years now, and uh, I'm just so proud of him. God's doing some amazing things in Tampa, Florida, and all over the world. We're in revival. I don't know if you know it or not, but we're in revival right now. You say, Are, is that for real? Yes, that is for real. Uh, it, it, we've talked about it. We've, 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 been saying we need revival. I'm telling you, revival is now. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, revival's here. If you're not experiencing it in your life, you better get with the program. Amen? Because you can be having revival in your home right now. You can be having revival in your workplace. You can be having revival. We're going to have revival this morning. We're already having it. Amen? Did you guys enjoy worship? Ooh, man. You know, you may have seen Janet up here dancing. You, you, many people don't even know this, but Janet, how long have you had a dance ministry? Uh, now it's been 25, 25 years. So she's been doing that for a long time, and she is trained, and she goes all over the place to different churches and conferences and just releases the Spirit of God through dance, uh, just like you saw this morning. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was a, a blessing. Amen. Well, I'm excited about the message this morning. Maybe more excited than I've been in a long time, because I'm, I get to talk about my favorite subject. Uh, of course, I mean, God, Jesus, I mean, I, say, I could say that every week, right? But this morning, I get to talk about a very important person, a very powerful person. Uh, you, you ever heard anybody say, I, I, you know, like, I need some yard work done, I know a guy. You know, everybody say, I know a guy. You, oh, I need a, my car. I need a good mechanic. Oh, I know a guy. Well, you may say, well, I need some more power in my life. I know a guy. I know a guy. His name's the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this morning I get to talk to you about the Holy Spirit. You know, last week, Pastor Cody did such an amazing job of sharing with all the campuses at one time. Um, a message called Living the Dream, and he's talking about the value of vision in your life and, and how God will give you a God vision. And oftentimes, actually all the time, uh, when God gives you a vision, it's bigger than anything that you can fulfill in your own power, which means that you better be tapped into something more powerful than you. Amen? If God's given you a vision for your life, it connects with a greater vision that connects to the family of God. If he's given you a vision for your life, then that means that he's going to give you the power to fulfill it, but not in your own strength. It's not by might. It's not by power. But what's it say? It's by my spirit, says the Lord. See, if you're trying to do it any other way, you're going to fail. There's a lot of people, a lot of really good people, a lot of good intention hardworking, high character people that go to church on Sunday morning that try to fulfill all the different obligations that surround that. But at the end of the day, if you're not hooked into the Holy Spirit, you're going to fail. I'm telling you right now, you can take that to the bank, you can cash that check because it is not going to happen unless you are empowered by a person and that person is the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? And the Holy Spirit, you know, we, we talk about God, and God does not have a personality disorder. Because sometimes people say, well, God's got three personalities. He doesn't have three personalities. He has three persons. We have God the Father, we have God the Son, that's Jesus, and we have God the Holy Spirit. And I think a lot of us are like, well, you know, I can get with God the Father, there's God up there, big God, you know, he's master ruler over everything, creator of the universe. I get with that. And I can understand God, the son, Jesus, because he came and he died for us and he came in the form of a man and, and he did all these things and miracles and signs and we have records. I can get with God, the son, but I'm not sure 
about God the Holy Spirit. I don't really understand God the Holy Spirit, but what I want to tell you is they've all been here from the beginning. Not just one of them. It wasn't just God the Father at creation. It was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit from the very beginning. You want me to prove it to you? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Flip on down a little bit and said, And the Word became flesh. That's Jesus. And He dwelt among us. Okay, so that's God the Father. Because it says He was God and He was with God. God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, came flesh and dwelt among us. So where was the Holy Spirit? There's a scripture that said the Spirit was brooding over the waters. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> that just got me excited. I just got the little, you know, the little things on your arm. that, uh, whoo. The gooseys. <laughs> when you think about the fact that they were all three there from the beginning. Sometimes we're like, yeah, I can get with God the Father and God the Son, but I'm not sure about God the Holy Spirit. Go down a little further. I think it's 26 or 28 of, of chapter 1 in Genesis where it says, let us create man in our image. Who's he talking about? Is he got losing it? Like me and my other personalities? No, he's talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy. Let us create man in our image. There from the beginning. I'm telling you, it, it's, it's amazing <clears throat> to see all the different times where you see all three of them at once. I'll give you another one in the New Testament. Y'all remember Jesus when he was baptized. And John the Baptist baptizes him, he dunks him, full immersion, no sprinkles. Up. When he comes up out of the water, we've got Jesus there. And God can't contain himself, so he rips open the heavens and he says, That's my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit said, I ain't missing out on this. And it said he descended like a dove upon him. Amen? We got all three of them in one place again. Did y'all like that movie? <laughs> That's why we don't video. All right. Listen, I, I just want to make the point that all three of them, there's not one that's more powerful, that's more worthy, that's, that, that's a higher position. No, they all work in unison together in unity to perform the Father's will. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They all work together. Amen? Amen. If we were to ask believers today, if they believe in the Holy Spirit... A lot of them would say, yeah, I believe in the Holy Spirit. But that's about as far as it goes. They don't understand the Holy Spirit. And so religion has a way of trying to uh, understand God. Religion, you need to know this, is man's attempt to get to God. Amen? But that's not what God, God is about relationship. That's why he sent his son Jesus, because Jesus is, is interested in getting to us. Amen? So a lot of times in religions, they talk about God the Father, they talk about God the Son, but they don't talk about God the Holy Spirit. In fact, recently I, I, I went to a camp setting, and there was this dynamic speaker. He was awesome. And he was talking about all these biblical concepts for these kids, and he was taking them out of Acts, but it was a later part of Acts and he was saying, y'all need to live like this, and y'all need to do this, and y'all need to do this. And I turned to the person sitting next to me, and I said, he forgot about the first part of Acts. The empowering part of Acts, where the Holy Spirit came upon them and empowered them to be able to live a godly life. So we got a lot of people that are trying to live a godly life without the Holy Spirit. And I don't know that it's totally their fault. I mean, I, I, I know for a fact that the enemy has worked overtime in our earth, in this world, to discredit and discount the Holy Spirit. In fact, he does it through a lot of people. So we've got like, you know, two sides of this coin. One side is over here on the far left, and it's like, you know what? I don't even know there is so much as a Holy Spirit. I haven't even heard of it. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to come near that. Then on the other side over here, we've got 
crazy Holy Spirit people that are just do whatever comes to their mind and it's just pure craziness and zeal and it's out of control. And so people that are in the middle are like, well, I don't think that's it either. I just want to tell you that some of the representations that you've had of crazy Holy Spirit is not the Holy Spirit. It's just crazy people. <laughs> I'm serious. I've been around for a while. They're crazy with or without the Holy Spirit. That's just who they are. They're just crazy. <laughs> I mean, they can call it whatever they want, but like, it's just craziness. Listen, I want to tell you today, the Holy Spirit is not crazy. The Holy Spirit is not out of control. The Holy Spirit is not absent. The Holy Spirit is good. The Holy Spirit is, is my friend. Can I talk to you today about my friend, the Holy Spirit? I hope he's your friend too. A lot of us don't understand everything about the Holy Spirit because, like I said, there's been bad actors. I, I made this analogy. Who, who watched Scooby-Doo? Come on, wave your hand at me if you're a Scooby-Doo guy. I know my dad wouldn't let me watch Scooby-Doo because we were church people, you know, so you can't watch Scooby-Doo because there's ghosts and there's bad people in there. But if you watch Scooby-Doo, at the end of every show, you know, they're running scared. They're, oh, my gosh, there's a, there's a ghost. There's a this. And at the end, they're like, zoinks. <laughs> it's just Mr. Mr. Peters in a costume, you know. He's just a bad actor acting like a ghost. And that's what we've seen a lot. It's just bad actors acting like the Holy Spirit, but that's not the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit does something, it's good. When the Holy Spirit does something, it's, it's everybody says amen to it. Everybody says that was good. Amen? So I want to talk to you about that because some people don't know whether they have the Holy Spirit or whether they don't. They don't know, do they even need the Holy Spirit? Or how do I get the Holy Spirit? So I want to talk to you today about that. If you've been introduced to Jesus, how did you get introduced to Jesus? How did you get Jesus in your life if you got saved? You may not know this, but Jesus didn't come to you personally and say, well, if he did, I mean, that's amazing. I mean, I'm not going to discredit that but because God can do whatever he wants. But the Bible tells us that it's the Holy Spirit that leads us into salvation. You might not have even known that. You, you might have thought you just showed up at a, at a spot. This morning you might get saved. You might have thought, I just came with a family member. Or I don't know how I got here. Listen, the Holy Spirit is leading you through all different sets of circumstances and things to get you to where he wants you. Amen? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, that no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That's pretty explicit, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says that it's by one spirit that we are baptized into the body. Whether Jews or Greeks or whether slaves are free, we've all made, been made to drink into one spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that baptizes us into the body of Christ. So if you're a believer today, it's because the Holy Spirit went after you and baptized you into the body of Christ. Amen? When you get saved, I want to say this because I want you to have an understanding of this. When you get saved... Because some people say, I got saved, I got God. Well, if that means that I got God, then that means I got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's talk about that. You did. When you got saved, you got all of God. You didn't get a portion of God, you got all of God. Okay? And then the Bible tells us that we're to repent and what? Then be baptized. So the Holy Spirit baptizes you in to the body of Christ. Other disciples can baptize you in water. Which, what is Water. You get baptized for the remission of sins. That means the old man is cut off. It's left behind in those waters and you're free and, and, and able to walk in newness of life. Amen. You, you may have heard uh, Shayla this morning talking about uh, the children of Israel. Okay. It's a picture of what our lives are supposed to look like. Because they got saved from Egypt out of the world. They got saved. They were on their journey. All of a sudden they get to a Red Sea moment. The Bible says that they, he stretched out his rod over the Red Sea. It parted. They walked through the Red Sea, which is a picture of water baptism. And then when they got all the way through the other side, it says the Egyptian army, the thing that had been pursuing them and harassing them, was in the sea. And the Bible says he closed up the sea upon them, and they were no more. They were finished. That's that old life. That's that old harassment. That's that old thing that's been attached to you. Now it's gone. 
But it didn't stop there. As they were in the wilderness, it says that they were led by a cloud by day and a fire by night. What is that a picture of? The Holy Spirit. So they were saved. They were water baptized. And then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were led by the Holy Spirit. This is what I want to tell you. When you get saved, you get all of God. But when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, God gets all of you. Amen? What is it? It's full surrender. Listen, I've been saved for a long time. I got saved when I was five years old. I'm 43, so I've been saved for 38 years. I've been in church my entire life. I, was, I went to church a long time before I got saved. Five years. <laughs> I mean, there was times when I just slept through church. Other times I pooped my diaper in church. But I was a baby. <laughs> but when I was 11 years old, I went to a camp. And they were talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. There was something on the inside of me that said, I need that. So I went down front and I can remember raising my hands. And I can, I can remember it clearly being filled with the Holy Spirit at 11 years old. Can I tell you that my life has never been the same from that moment on? I'm not saying it's been perfect, but from that moment on, I've had a friend called the Holy Spirit that I have tried to get closer to and listen to and be more submitted to and yielded to the older I get. And my relationship with the Holy Spirit is way better today than it was when I was 11. And it's going to be way better when I'm 75 than it is now. Amen? Why? Because when I was five, I got all of God. But when I was 11, he got all of me. Amen? And I've had moments in my life where I have continued to just give him more and more and more. I can remember very clearly uh, when my father died, the Holy Spirit said to me, now, I need you. You guys, I wish I could. Some of you understand this, but I wish... I could really convey to you how important the Holy Spirit is in my life. I wish I could tell you how good of a friend he's been. I wish I could tell you how much of a change he's made to my life. I'm telling you, I wouldn't be standing here today. I wouldn't have the wife that I have. I wouldn't have the children that I have. I wouldn't have the calling that I have without the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't have made it without the Holy Spirit. So what I'm talking to you today about is very personal and it's very real. You know, I could tell you story after story after story of how the Holy Spirit has changed our life. Words that have been given, dreams that have been given, prophetic utterances that have gone, gone forth, warfare that has happened because of the Spirit's prompting. I can tell you we've gone to people's houses and we have prayed in the Spirit and we've allowed the Holy Spirit to speak and things have shifted and things have changed. What would have happened had we not done that? I don't know, but I don't want to find out. But it's, being, it's all about being submitted and yielded to the Holy Spirit. Amen? When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get empowered to walk in the new man. I want to talk to you about how important it is. Because there's only a few events that get recorded in all four Gospels. You know, the Gospels were written by four different people at different times, covering different periods of the life of Jesus. The Gospels, when I talk about that, if you're new to the faith, are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. And there are some events, not all, but some events, a very few events that are recorded in all four Gospels. The birth of Jesus is recorded in all four Gospels. The death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. How many know those are some pretty crucial, important things to your faith? Guess what else is recorded in all four Gospels? The baptism in the Holy Spirit. All four Gospels. Matthew 3, John the Baptist is speaking. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I am whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Amen? Mark 1, 8 says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, 16 says, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but there's one mightier than I am that is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
Amen? Amen. And John says this, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, he, it is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. There's an important fact right there that, that if, you're, if you don't pay attention, you'll miss it. It says, upon, upon the person that you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. You see, I told you the Holy Spirit's been active from the beginning of time. And there's times in the Old Testament where we will see the Spirit of God move upon somebody. Like as in the case with Saul when it says that he came down and the prophets were prophesying and the Spirit of God came upon him. And all of a sudden he started prophesying with the prophets. We see times when Samson and other people did things of great feat of feats of strength and, and power and ability when the Holy Spirit would come upon them. But there's a change in the scene when Jesus comes on because it said the Spirit of God came upon him. It descended and it remained on him. See, that's the difference. See, I think there's a lot of people that get around the Spirit of God and in a setting like this, they feel the Spirit of God, but it's not necessarily indwelling on the inside of them. Amen. So it says Jesus. The, let me let me recap. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. Jesus baptizes us into the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, many people think that the last words of Jesus as he's going to heaven are what? Go and make disciples. That's not his last words. Luke 24, 49. He says this. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry, abide, stay in that place, wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now look, I don't know if you noticed it there, but Jesus is talking. He said, I'm sending the promise of my Father. The Holy Spirit's coming to give you some power. There's three in one. It's a picture again. They're all three present in the same place. What did Jesus know? He knew that when he left, he said, I'm, I'm leaving one better than me with you. And he's going to give you the power that you need to do my will upon this earth. Amen. Yeah. Acts 1, 4 and 5 says, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Mm. So some people say, well, you know, there was the outpouring of, of the Holy Spirit in Acts. Which honestly, a lot of people, a lot of churches don't even cover. It's like it doesn't exist in the Bible. I don't get it. But if they do cover it, they say, well, that was just a one-time thing. That that was for that that time, but it's not for today. The Holy Spirit's not for today. Well, that's not what my Bible says. Because in Acts 2.37, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said Peter, to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. What's he saying? Believe in the Lord Jesus. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Water baptized. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then he says this in verse 39, for the promise is to you and to your children. Is that just the Jewish people? Because he's talking to Jews. Is that just to the, oh no, he says, and to all who are afar off. That's me. That's me. And as many as the Lord our God will call. So he said, this is for everybody. Not just for now, but till the end of time. And if you want to go a little bit further, you'll find uh, in Acts 4 that they all get filled again. See, it's not a one-time feeling in the Holy Spirit. It's a continual feeling. In fact, I think you can be anointed with fresh oil every day of your life if you want it. Amen? In Acts 4, the same characters that got Filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, it says that the whole place that they were in shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit again. That's some power being released. I don't know about you, but I need more power in my life. Amen? And then we can go to Acts 8. And we find a man named Philip who went down to Samaria. And he was preaching Jesus to these Samaritans. And there was a lot of people there. All around in one accord. 
They were listening to the things that Philip was saying. And not only were they listening to what he was saying, but they were watching the power of God be released through Philip. I just want to like pause here for just a second. Because one of the things that people are not used to is seeing the power of God released in a real way. Not a fake way, in a real way. But I want you to know, even when the power of God is released through the Holy Spirit, and it causes a reaction, because listen, when you tap into power, there's a reaction. If you stuck your finger, Pastor Phil, he's right by that socket right there. If he stuck his finger into that socket, he wouldn't just be like, No, he'd be like, whoa, oh my. He'd pull that finger out and he'd be like, shocked me. Because there's a reaction when you touch power. But see, in the church, we're not used to seeing real power released. So sometimes it makes us a little nervous. I think we need to get a little more nervous in church. I think maybe if we were a little bit more nervous about the power of the Holy Spirit, we might be a little bit more respectful and reverential with the way we live our lives. Continue. This is what it says. They were listening to what Philip was saying, but they were also seeing the miracles that he was doing. And listen to this. This is what it said. For unclean spirits, demonic spirits, were crying with a loud voice... As they came out of many who were possessed. What would happen this morning if we started laying hands on people and demonic spirits started leaving? Some of you would start freaking out. Be like, I think I'm going to go up the street to the other church. Well, that's fine. Bless you. I'm telling you. I'm tired of playing church. I'm ready for the Holy Spirit to start doing what he's going to do. I don't know about you, but playing church ain't going to save you. Playing church ain't going to change you. Playing church isn't going to fix you. Tapping into the Holy Spirit's going to change you. Turn to your neighbor and say, what we need the most is the Holy Ghost. This man is telling you the truth. It says there was unclean spirits that were crying with a loud voice and they came out of many who were possessed. Then it says this, many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And then it says this, there was great joy in that city. How many can use a little more joy in your life? Amen. Amen. But there was this man named Simon who was, who previously practiced sorcery in the city. And he astonished the people of Samaria. He claimed that he was someone great. And they all were listening to him. And from the least to the greatest, they said, this man's got some great power from God. Must have. He's doing some stuff. I find it interesting in our society how we are, we are more attached to the power of Satan than we are to the power of God. I will. We'll go to movies, we'll read books, we'll watch all kinds of things. We believe all of the, the old folklores. We, we will tap into the demonic side of power and we will stay away from the real power. Amen? And I think there needs to be a shift in you. I think there needs to be a shift in me where I'm more open to the power of God being on display than I am to the power of Satan. Amen? These people were a little confused, though, because they were seeing some power released. I'm not going to lie to you and say that the enemy does not have a demonic power and presence on this earth. That would be false, too. But that's been happening from the beginning, too. If you remember when when Moses was going to lead the children of Israel out and he went before the the, the king and and remember he he threw down his rod and it turned into a snake as a display of the power of God. And then. What did, the, what did the Pharaoh say? He said, oh, I got guys that can do that too. I got magicians too. He's saying, that's just black magic. That's just demonic power. I've seen that before. So he calls Janice and Jambres in and he said, do your thing. And so they threw their staffs down and then theirs turned into snakes. But then, 
But then, like Pac Man, <laughs> Moses' snake ate the other two snakes. The power of God is stronger than the power of Satan, I'm just telling you. Amen? So they were experiencing a form of power, but when they saw Philip come in and display the real power of God through the Holy Spirit, then they were listening to him now, and they were astonished. It says that they believed Philip as he preached these things concerning the kingdom of God. What does that mean? That he was converting them. These Samaritans were becoming believers in Jesus. Then the next thing happened, which is what happens in all of our lives supposed to be. They repented. They were baptized. They were being baptized, men and women. Then Simon, who was formerly a sorcerer, he also started believing. He's like, whoa, what's happening here? This is a different power than I've ever experienced. And he got baptized and he uh, continued with Philip. He was amazed seeing all the miracles and the signs which were being done. Now... Verse 14, this is a very key verse. It says, now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem, remember this is being done at Samaria, uh, Samaria. When the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. Remember, Peter and John are full of the Holy Spirit. They've already had a couple of encounters. Uh, there's no telling. We don't have probably all the stuff that's been happening, but the Holy Spirit's been moving and working. And so they hear that there's some people getting converted to the Messiah, to Jesus, the real king. And they said, we, we, we're going to go down there and see what's happening. I love that the fact that when they came down here, when they came down there, it doesn't say that they began a conversation. They said, hey, what's going on? You know, oh, some good stuff happening here. Oh, let me see. Oh, this is oh, great. Yeah. Oh, hey, Philip. Hey, hey, you know, it says, listen, when they got there, they prayed for them immediately that they would receive the Holy Spirit. They said, this is all great, but you're just hanging out around the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit hanging around you. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I want to tell you this very clearly. You can go to a spirit-filled church, hang out around the Spirit of God, and not be baptized yourself. That's the truth. Verse 16 says, it had not fallen upon any of them yet. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Amen. And listen, when Simon saw that they received the Holy Spirit through laying on of hands, he offered them money. He's like, whoa, something happened. I don't know. It doesn't tell us exactly what happened there. It says they received the Spirit. But there was some kind of power released at that moment. Because all of a sudden, Simon the sorcerer, who had delved in, in a demonic power, saw another power released when that laying on of hands happened. He said, let me get my wallet out. I need that right there. I'll pay for that. But you can't pay for it. It's not to be bought. It's only to be received. It's a gift. Amen? But you have to receive it. See, here's the, he, here's the thing. Simon the sorcerer got rebuked because what he was trying to do was get it for his own gain. Can I tell you, the Holy Spirit is not just for your gain. I mean, you're going to get something out of it, but it's to be released through you into other people. I'm telling you. So, what was the result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? We see that it's very clearly, it, is, it has happened multiple times. Uh, if you want to continue on, uh, read in Acts uh, chapter 19. It says, uh, and, and it happened, verse 1, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. So this is a long time after this. Paul is now on the scene. And he said he found some disciples. What does that mean? Those were believers. He found some believers in Jesus. And this is the question he asked him. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said to him, we hadn't even so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. That's a lot of people right now. You would be surprised at how many people are like, I don't even know what you're talking about. He said, we haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, well, then to what were you baptized? They said, we were baptized into John's baptism. Paul said, well, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who should come after him. That's on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. 
Amen? And you know what else happened? They spoke with tongues and they prophesied. So what happened when they got hands laid on them? They spoke in tongues and they prophesied. I just heard it. Somebody just said, oh, no, now he's going into speaking in tongues. We were all good with just being filled with the Holy Spirit, but now you're going to have to go and mess it all up with that weird tongue thing. Can I help you a little bit this morning? We have had a wrong theology about speaking in tongues. Because somewhere along the line, it became the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to correct it this morning. It is not the evidence. It is a evidence. Now, listen, I, I grew up and I stood in the altar and had somebody lay hands on me for what seemed like an eternity so that I would have proof that I'd been filled with the Holy Spirit. Like, come on, just say something. Say something and we'll stop praying for you. <laughs> so I, I did. I remember that. I mean, I like, you know, I was like, I should have bought a Kia. Who stole my Honda? <laughs> Whatever I got to say for you to stop laying hands on me. But we've had that philosophy and theology run through the church. And what it does is allows man to judge whether you have the Holy Spirit or not. Man cannot judge whether you have the Holy Spirit. So speaking in tongues is not the requirement for having the Holy Spirit. It is a gift. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. Speaking in tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying don't speak in tongues. I'm saying that is not the only proof that you have received the Holy Spirit and been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, I feel like I want to tell you right now that as a church and as a church leadership, all of the pastors, all of the key leaders in this church, the Heights Church, and all of our campuses, we are spirit-filled. And we speak in tongues. That shouldn't weird you out because it's not for you. <laughs> my language is a personal language that I use in my prayer time. It's not on display for everybody. In fact, if I give a message in tongues in a service like this, the Bible tells us decently in order means that there should be an interpretation of tongues that follows. So you're not going to hear me unless I'm saying who stole Makia, whatever. <laughs> but that's not real tongues anyways. You're not going to hear me do that unless I'm surrounded by other believers who have their prayer language. So when we get in leadership meetings, when we get in things like that, you better believe that we pray in the Spirit. Why do we do that? Because the Bible clearly tells us that we should pray in the Spirit. In Ephesians 6, it says, put on the full armor of God, the, the whole armor of God. What is the whole armor of God? Well, many of us were like, I got the helmet of salvation. I got the breastplate of righteousness. I got the shield of faith. I've got the belt of truth. I've got my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I've got the sword of the spirit in my hands. But it doesn't stop right there. It says praying always in the spirit. That's what it says. So you better believe as a church and as leaders, you want your leaders praying always in the spirit. Amen. I cannot tell you how many times the Holy Spirit has woke me up in the middle of the night and I didn't know what I was praying for, but he said, pray in the Spirit. Anybody wave at me if that's ever happened to you. I cannot tell you how many times that the Holy Spirit has, that I've had breakthroughs happen in the Spirit as I prayed in the Spirit. So, Paul, you think Paul was, Paul was pretty, pretty good guy, right? He wrote, a lot of the New Testament. A lot of the teachings of the church that we follow today were Paul's teachings. Are Paul's teachings. And Paul said, I pray in the Spirit more than all of you. I pray in tongues more than all of you. That's what he said. Dwight L. Moody, who was a huge evangelist, I've talked to you a little bit about him before, that really changed the world. Held revivals, 20 and 30,000 people saw miracles happen. He said that his ministry had no power in, until he received the Holy Spirit. He was doing ministry without the power. Many of us are trying to live our lives without the power. 
Speaking in tongues is, is one version of the power, but can I tell you some other things that happen? You get power, you get fruits. How many want fruit in your life? The Bible says that they'll know you by your fruit, by what's being produced in your life. So let me tell you, Galatians 5.22, it says, but the Holy Spirit produces, produces, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our life. It produces love, a supernatural kind of love. It produces joy. It produces peace. It produces long-suffering. Anybody had to have some long-suffering in your life? <laughs> like, I've been married 20 years. I've been having some long-suffering. <laughs> I mean, partner, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> it is the ability to stick some things out. I mean... I need the, the power of the Holy Spirit in my marriage. Do you? Amen. More than I need it, my wife needs the power of the Holy Spirit in our marriage. We just celebrated 23 years of marriage Friday. And it's been the best two years of my life. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we have a wonderful marriage. I don't want you to think anything else. But there is some parts of our marriage where we had to have a willingness to stick it out. We had to have an empowering by the Holy Spirit to stick it out. We wouldn't be still married if the Holy Spirit hadn't spoken some pretty powerful things to my wife and said, don't give up on that loser. <laughs> One of these days, he's going to get full of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he gives us the fruit of gentleness. We need more gentle people in the world. We need more people that have compassion in their heart for other people. We got enough bitterness. We got enough ugliness. We got enough anger and maliciousness and people going after each other. I want to tell you right now, we're not battling flesh and blood. We're not against sections of community. We're not, we're not against sections of people. I know this month is really hard for a lot of people on both sides of the aisle because it's Pride Month. Anybody seen anything about that anywhere? Maybe. Somewhere. But if we're not careful, we will address the people. Listen, I want to tell you, as much as God loves you and loves believers, he loves those people too. He's after those people. He, he wants to save them. He wants to redeem them. He wants to forgive them. Amen? I don't say that as a free pass. I'm just saying we need to be careful in the church of not addressing people or addressing labels and, and understanding that the person behind that is valuable to God. Amen? I'm not a conservative. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a liberal. I'm a Christian. Amen? I serve Jesus. I'm an American, but I'm a Christian first. So I'm called to love. I don't care what religion, race, creed you are. It doesn't matter. I'm called to love you. I have to remind myself, and guess what? If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you won't be able to do this. <laughs> How do you know that? Because I've had to get filled again with the Holy Spirit to love certain people. Amen? <laughs> Just because I'm a pastor don't mean I love all of you. <laughs> i got to have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but a gentleness is a compassion in our heart. Goodness is a conviction of basic holiness. We need more holiness in our culture. Amen? Respect and reverence for the things of God. We need, we need supernatural faith. We need to continue to believe for miracles, signs, and wonders. And that they're not a thing of yesterday, but the Holy Spirit wants to do them today. Wants to do them this morning. Amen? Amen. Meekness, which is not a weakness, but it's a strength and it's a power under control. Which leads me to the next one, self-control. Boy, how much different would some of our lives be if we had just yielded ourselves to the Holy Spirit instead of flying off the handle or saying something stupid or doing something stupid. If we would have just said, Holy Spirit, you got another way in this moment? A lot of times he'd say, yeah, shut your mouth. Don't say it. Other times he says, say it. Recently I was with somebody and they were telling me all this stuff that was happening in their family. And I, while they're talking, the Holy Spirit said, tell her. And I'm like, she's still talking. Do, 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 do. And, and I'm like, I don't know. He said, tell her she's got a spirit of offense. And I'm like, well, that's just not good timing. 
I'm serious. I'm having that conversation. And louder, he says, tell her. And I said, okay. I said, listen, the reason you're dealing with A, B, and C, and you've been struggling with that for decades, the reason, I said, you're, you're, you're offended at what happened when you were younger and blah, blah, blah. Man, boom, immediately she broke. She just starts sobbing. She's like, you're right. The Holy Spirit knows what we need. He knows how to direct us. He knows how to, to give us the self-control to be able to say things we need to say and not say things that we don't need to say. Amen? Amen. He gives us these things. And the Bible says in Luke 11, which I think we don't understand this a lot because we don't, we don't finish the statement. But it says, I, I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Has anybody ever heard a, a sermon on that? Ask, seek, and knock. Ask, seek, and knock. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? And if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, is he going to give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. Now listen to this. He said, ask, seek, and knock. Ask, seek, and knock. What is he telling you to ask, seek, and knock for? He said, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, he said, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We don't ever preach that, do we? We just think we're talking about asking for things. Like, you know what? If I'm just persistent, I just pray hard enough, and then I'm going to get it. If I ask him and I seek him and I knock him and I keep asking and I keep seeking. No, he's talking about ask, seek, and knock for the Holy Spirit. He's saying you want the Holy Spirit. That's what you need the most is the Holy Ghost. Amen? So he gives you fruits. And then I can't get into all these because i got to move. But read 1 Corinthians 12 and it talks about all the gifts that he gives. And it's through the Holy Spirit. He gives word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healings, working of miracles, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. It's right there. And then prophecy, which the Bible tells us clearly that tongues in a corporate setting like this, unless they are a, a word in tongues, not the language of tongues, but a, a word given in tongues, have to have an interpretation of tongues. But he, this is what he said, I'd rather that you prophesy. Because everybody can understand it and everybody can benefit from it. So as a church, if you go here long enough, you're going to understand. If you come through Connect, if you come through an Encounter Night, you're going to understand that prophetic is something that our church believes in and participates in and you will see. Stick around long enough, you'll get a prophetic word, I'm telling you. How many have had a prophetic word in this house? Praise the Lord. Prophetic words have changed my life. Prophetic words will change your life. Somebody told me the other day, and I don't even remember this. They said, I'm still hanging on to that word you gave me a year and a half ago. And then they told me the word I gave them, and I was like, wow, I don't even remember giving that. But they have, it's changed the course of their life because the Holy Spirit was able to speak to them through another person. Amen? And this is what I want to get to. All of these good things come from the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says this, but know this. What does it mean? That word know is konosko. It means have a personal knowledge of this. That in the last days, perilous times are coming. He said there's going to be men that are lovers of themselves. There's men that are, and you can probably say, yeah, that we're there. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then verse 5. In the last day, he said, there's going to be people that have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. And then it says this. From such people, turn away. Don't have participation with people that are going to tell you all about God, but not allow you to participate in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you this. One and only point. We believe in the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. 
The devil would love to convince you that the Holy Spirit was for yesterday. Yet it's not operating today. I want to tell you, you need the Holy Spirit in your life today. You need to be filled. And if it's been a while, you need to be filled again. Because whatever God's taking you into, you cannot do it in your own strength. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by His Spirit, says the Lord. Will you stand with me? If you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, that's step number one. The Holy Spirit actually brought you to this moment to make a decision. Will you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no other way outside of him? I want everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. This is just a moment between you and God. If that's you today and you say, I need to do that. I, I, I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. He said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. He said, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that everything changes in your life if you will, if you will accept him into your heart. If you will say, I need you, Jesus. If that's you today and you say, I need, I need you, Jesus. I, I need to make that decision. I want you to raise your hand right there where you're at. The Holy Spirit led you to this moment. Will you say yes to him? To say, I, I need to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to open it up just a little bit more. Maybe you've just been away from God. Maybe you've been doing your own thing. You've been trying your own way and you're just, you're saying it's not working. I need to come back to Jesus. If today you're saying I'm making a fresh recommitment of my faith to Jesus, I just want you to raise your hand right there where you're at. You're saying I'm coming back to him. Raise it high. Raise it loud so, so we can see it. Thank you. Thank you. Hands going up everywhere. Thank you. Come on, recommit to Jesus today. It's the best decision that you can make. Say, I'm going to serve you with my whole heart. I'm coming back to you, Jesus. Come on, raise your hand if that's you. Say, I'm doing that right now. I want to say a prayer with you. Can we say this prayer all together? Everybody repeat it. Say, Jesus, say, I need you. I'm coming to you, Jesus. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I accept what you did for me, that gift of forgiveness, that free gift of grace. I receive you into my heart, and I repent of every sin that I've committed. I ask you to forgive me, to wash me clean in the blood of the Lamb, in Jesus' name. Starting today, I will serve you with my whole heart. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Listen, if you made that commitment, come on, can we give them a hand this morning? If you made that commitment, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit wants to empower you to be able to walk that thing out. Amen? So what we're going to do right now is, everybody's saved in here. If you're not, you had your chance. I hope you get saved. All you got to do is believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. He said you will be saved. But for everyone else, what we're going to do is we're going to open these altars up right here. Because this is what I believe the Holy Spirit is wanting, wanting me to shut up so he can do what he wants to do. I want you to come down to this front and we've got anointing oil. What we're going to do is we're going to lay hands just like they did in the New Testament. We're going to lay hands on you and we're going to believe God for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit this morning. Amen. Now listen. That doesn't mean that you're going to speak in tongues unless the Holy Spirit wants that. But whatever the Holy Spirit does, you just want to yield yourself fully to the Holy Spirit. If that's you this morning, you say, I need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. I just want you to go ahead and move out from where you're at and come on down here to the front. Be bold. Say, I need a fresh infilling. I need, need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Come on. Have some boldness today. Lord, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, give them boldness to be able to step out from where they're at and come down here and get what they need, God. Don't let them be stopped from getting what they need. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. Keep coming, keep coming. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.